Hello, welcome to the Dear Nikki podcast, where I'm going to be giving you personalized user research advice based on your questions or struggles. So let's dive into today's episode. Hello, everybody. I am so excited to be back with a slightly off-brand podcast episode. I'm going to go on a bit of a riff, not going to lie. So if riffing isn't your thing, then skip this one. No no hard feelings. I'm totally here for that. The Q&A is a really powerful tool. I've been loving it so much, but something came to me yesterday, actually. So I am recording this on Thursday, November 24th. So for all of those of you who are celebrating Thanksgiving, I am sending you a very warm and happy Thanksgiving. We don't celebrate that over here in the UK <laughs> for very obvious reasons, but I I do sometimes miss Thanksgiving, not the actual holiday, which is a bit controversial to be to be completely fair. But I miss that feeling of friends and family and food. It's just like lots of food. And I must say, American Thanksgiving food, like sweet potatoes with marshmallows in them, it's like, it sounds gross if you haven't had it before. But if you have had it, you know what I'm talking about. It's amazing. Look it up. Sweet potatoes with marshmallows. If you haven't had it, just believe and try it. (laughs) Try it out. You will never be the same again. So yes, happy Thanksgiving to all of you who are celebrating it. And for those of you who are working, (laughs) um, good luck today. (laughs) I know that uh, people in America, or uh, of course, those who might be celebrating Thanksgiving outside of America have Thursday and Friday off. So for for those of us who are still working, may, may may the force be with you. Anyways, so last night I was listening to a podcast and uh, some some context behind this. I am part of a mastermind of female entrepreneurs who are looking to grow and scale their businesses. So, you know, I I do hold masterminds myself, but I am also part of masterminds. My focus has shifted away from learning more about user research into learning more about business. So that's sales strategy, marketing strategy, content strategy, and all that fun stuff that felt like I was starting from scratch when I started my business. It didn't actually feel like it. I was starting from scratch. Anyways, I'm part of that mastermind and it's a it's a group container. It's nine months long, super helpful. And the person who leads that mastermind has a podcast. And I was listening to her podcast last night and she went, she's she's a riffer most of the time, which I really appreciate. I think it's super cool. And so I was listening and, and she was talking about how we kind of go from coach to coach, looking up on the internet, you know, what is the right strategy for me? What's the right copy for me? Right? So what's, how do I, what's the right funnel? What's the right this, that, or the other thing more, more in the business lingo. And this took me a really long time within my business. It's something that I still struggle with, but I started thinking, this is actually very applicable to user research because when I started as a user researcher, way back when, I would spend hours on Google. I would just, honestly, most of my time would be spent on Google searching things. I almost said Googling. (laughs) On Google Googling, (laughs) searching things like what do personas look like? What information is in personas? What information is in journey maps? How do you create a journey map? How do you do a one-on-one interview? How do you ask unbiased questions? What is a user research process? What should you be doing in your user research process? How to set up a user research framework? Like 99 questions instead of 99 problems. I had 99 questions. (laughs) So I also had 99 problems too, trying to figure all of these things out to be super honest. So I am here because what happened to me is I was almost trying to copy and paste something. So I wanted somebody to tell me the right way to do everything. What is the right way to ask a question? What is the right research process? What should my research process be? 
what should, how should I set up a research framework in an organization, right? Like all of these shoulds, how should I do something? What is the perfect process? What is the right way to do it? And I struggled with this for a very long time because what I was searching for doesn't really exist. And what I mean by that is, yes, there are great ways to ask open-ended, unbiased questions. For example, the Ted W method, which I'll link to in the show notes. There are wonderful ways and parts of a research process that are very important to include, but that does not mean that there is one right perfect way that you should be doing things. And I have a lot of people come to me for my mentorship program and they talk about this problem. I want a better user research process. I want to gain confidence in my approach and process. I want to feel like less of an imposter. And usually what has happened is similar to me, they've gone online and they've looked and looked and looked and done research as we as we do as researchers. We, we look and we gather all of this research and we kind of synthesize it into what we feel like should be the right process. And I, again, am here to say there is no one right way. And the way that is best for you is going to be one that you build on your own. Right. So again, there are certain components that you can add to your research process. So for instance, for a really long time, I didn't have an intake document. I didn't have like an intake request process. So what would happen is stakeholders would come to me via standing by my desk and saying, Hey, I want some research done, sending me an email, sending me a Slack message. So I didn't have a formalized intake process. And what that generally led to, it wasn't the, the worst thing in the world, but what that led to is, was a lot more meetings, a lot more back and forth, a lot more time spent trying to pull information out of them that I needed rather than having a set of questions for them to answer and then submit to me. And then we can go from a more aligned and a more shared understanding starting point. But just because I didn't have that formalized intake process doesn't mean that my process was wrong, right? I was, I was learning things and understanding things more. And when I saw that there was an opportunity for optimizing my process, I went for it. And let me tell you, my first intake form was like three questions and to be completely fair, kind of useless. I'm like, what is the research that you want? And people would just answer similar to, they would, to how they would in an email. But what I did is I understood slowly over time what I needed from my stakeholders. So what would make my process from when they request research to when they get whatever deliverable better, right? For, for me, what is the information that I need to know? What is the information that in my mind helps me connect dots, right? Because like not everybody needs a formalized intake process. That might not be something that one works at your organization because of the culture of your organization, or two, you might be at a super small organization that doesn't need an intake process because you're just talking to your colleagues all the time, right? Or maybe there's another way that they request research. I know that at one organization, I had research requests coming in through JIRA, which was really odd, but hey, you know, it was fine. So what I'm trying to say here is that there is not one right way to do something. And if what you're doing is trying to copy and paste the ideal perfect way, first off, you're going to be very disappointed because when you try and fit something in to an organization that isn't the same as somebody else's organization. So let's say you're working at a small startup and you find out Google's research process. And you just take that and you say, let's put this in here. It's like trying to put a square peg into a round hole. There are a lot of things that work maybe for Google that aren't going to work for your organization, right? And they're not going to work for your process. So one, you might be very disappointed and it might be very disheartening and it might 
have you or lead to you losing a bit of confidence as a researcher because you're looking at Google and saying, well, this is Google's research process. Why isn't it working for me? Why can't I make this work? If you can't tell already, this is something that I tried to do. I took a idealized research process that I kind of gathered from a few different companies and tried to shove it in to a startup and I failed. And it was so disheartening and I lost a lot of confidence as a researcher, but luckily I was able to kind of pivot and say, okay, it's not because of me. It's because of this structure. It's just different. It's apples to oranges. It's a square peg round hole, right? So first off, yes, you will be very disappointed if you try to shove something into an organization, a culture, or a process that doesn't fit. The second thing is when you take a research process that isn't yours, that you haven't made yours, what happens is it comes off, and this is kind of like what I realized with content strategy and marketing, it comes off as stiff and robotic, and you don't have that same confidence in it that you would if it was yours, right? So when I started doing email marketing, when I started creating content and copy, I was trying the same mechanisms of copying and pasting and it didn't come out right. So a lot of you might read my articles on Dscout. That is just me. That is my writing style. That's how I write primarily. I have a few different voices, but that's my primary voice is just kind of this straightforward. Here's some knowledge. Here's some ways to do it. Maybe let's throw in a self-deprecating joke. <laughs> so that's me, but I didn't use that voice when I was writing content. I didn't use that voice when I was doing copy and email marketing, and it felt so robotic and so stiff and so inauthentic. And the same thing can happen to you with your research process if you're just copying and pasting it and trying to do somebody else's research process. Because what happens is you can take a, a general research process, right? We have planning, we have recruitment, scheduling, we have conducting, we have analysis, we have deliverable and activation, right? So all the way through and through, that is a general research process. You take that and you make it your own. You do the things that feel good for you within that process. You learn how that process works for you rather than letting the process own you yourself, right? So sometimes we try and kind of stick to things and be very strict and rigid about, oh, but this is how it should be. No, there aren't any shoulds, right? Yes, we want quality research. Yes, we want rigor. I am not out here telling you to do generative research only with five people. <laughs> I am telling you that if everybody says recruitment is meant to take two weeks and this is exactly how you're meant to do it and it's not working for you because of your organization, because of whatever budget, whatever it is, find a way for you to make it work, right? So this is something that I did with my process is I took the general process and I said, how can I make this work for me? Where, where can I optimize things? Where are my boundaries? And this is the most important part. Where are your boundaries? So for instance, if somebody comes to me with a project and they're like, we want to do generative research and we want to do it in two weeks. I'm like, haha, bye. <laughs> no, that is a boundary that I'm not willing to cross. Right? So you, you make this process you, your own and you gain confidence as a researcher within that process because it's yours, because you know what you're doing, you know your stuff. You you can, and, and this is the beauty of it is when you go into a job interview and they ask you this horrendous question, instead of saying, you know, scoping and recruitment and these generalizations, you can say, this is what I do. This is my process. And if you're asking me to recruit, you know, 25 people and conduct generative research and churn out personas in two weeks, this is not the place. So it also helps you with weeding out opportunities that are just not good for you. So there, there there's just, I just can't explain this. enough. <laughs> if you saw me, I'm like gesturing everywhere, <laughs> which is if, if I sound out of breath, that's why <laughs> it's like a mini workout, but there's so much great greatness that comes from taking your research process and making it yours instead of trying to follow somebody else's, right? So 
and the only way we can do this is to practice it, to see how it goes, to c constantly be making notes and saying, okay, this didn't work out or I didn't feel that great about this, right? So I used to have stakeholders listening to my interviews and they used to be able to talk during my interviews. So I would, they would, they would actually like interrupt me kind of to ask questions, right? And after a while, because that's how other people did it. That's how I knew some people were doing it. They were like, yeah, that's fine, whatever. And after a while I was like, no, this isn't fine for me because it throws off my kind of flow. It throw to me, it throws off the participant. It can introduce some bias if that person isn't asking questions in a super great way. And then I'm trying to backtrack the question and it's just a mess, right? And the another thing, I used to take my own notes, right? And now what I do is I train stakeholders to take notes because I was just like, I can't, I can't do that. I can't do these two things at once. Somebody else has to take notes. I'm going to train my stakeholders. They are going to take notes when they come. They learn something. They pay attention. We all win, right? I can pay attention. It's, it's, it's a great situation, right? So understanding just because we learn something from somebody else doesn't mean that we have to take it with us, right? We can make it feel better for ourselves and use whatever we kind of learn and make it ours. So I'm going to link to some examples in the show notes. I, I do have a particular article about creating your research process and creating boundaries around that. And it might be a really nice thought exercise or for somebody who's sitting here thinking, okay, but like, where do I start? Because it's always start hard to start with a blank page, right? You're sitting there and you're like, what's my process? <laughs> so what I'm going to do is within that article, I have an example of a research process and you can take that and you can start to build your own because what I want us to be doing is building our own processes so that we feel more confident that we know what we're doing, right? That it's ours because it should be yours. You don't have to copy and paste it from somebody else. You don't have to look at somebody who's like such a fantastic researcher and just take what they have and try and shove it into your process, try and shove it into your organization and then feel bad when it doesn't work. No. You can say no to things. You can understand what works for you, what works for your organization. My research practice changes in different organizations. It changes slightly when I do freelance and that's okay. I have like three different frameworks essentially, you know? So I have one for consultancy and freelance and I have two within organizations. One is for a smaller organization, like small startup or small midsize. And then one's for a larger organization because those are the places that I've worked and the situations that I've worked in and I've made those my own so that when I go in, you know, I have this process and that doesn't mean that it doesn't change. It's I've iterated on this process so much, I will probably continue to iterate on it. And that's okay because it grows and evolves with you. So I'm done riffing. <laughs> I hope that this was helpful for you and made you feel some sort of comfort or some sort of energy and inspiration and maybe made some of you feel a little bit better if, if you have ever felt like I did where I was trying to make something work that just wasn't working, right? It's not about you, right? We need to, we need to allow ourselves to fail and iterate and to really like take things in on our, as our own because failure is just, it's such a positive experience. I'm also gonna to link to my failure journal as well because that's one way that I kind of started to understand my process and where my improvements were and where I could leave things behind. So yes, <laughs> I hope that that was helpful. And if you're listening to this again on Thanksgiving and and um, you you are celebrating, one thing to be grateful for is you know what? We can make these processes our own. They don't have to be something that's alien and foreign to us and not feeling good. We can we can make these things feel good for us. So I'm going to stop ranting, get off my soapbox, <laughs> maybe. And I hope you all enjoyed that. Please feel free to give any feedback on this. My contact details are in the show notes, of course. And I look forward to the next episode. Thank you so much. See you later. Thanks again for listening. Don't forget to hit subscribe and submit your next question. And I look forward to talking to you all soon. Bye.